everybody's going to have a different way of looking at this. So we might start here with Sarah, who's right beside me. Sarah is a global health professional based in Southeast Asia for more than 15 years and now informs GFAX international health programs. She helps cover prevention and treatment of communicable diseases with a focus on HIV, sanitation and hygiene, and engaging with civil society in health responses, and monitoring the evaluation and learning. And Sarah's got a master's in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene. Over to you, and just to let you know, after Sarah speaks, I'll invite one question, and I'll do that after each speaker. And at the end, it's open slather, so enjoy. Thanks, Chris, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this event. I think it's fantastic for what we're doing for one another and giving people to share their experiences and knowledge and so I'm not really sure I am the wisest choice for giving <laughs> career advice because my own career has not been I um, dropped out of uni the first time, ran away to London and became a chef. And then after several years of working as a chef, I realized that I actually wanted a little more intellectual stimulation um, of a different sort. And so I went back to the AMU where I started doing um, an undergrad. And uh, there was quite public health focus. Public health has always been something that um, I view as a really useful tool for providing positive impacts in people's lives. The way people uh, interact with healthcare systems, the way health impacts every aspect of their life for me been a really uh, meaningful driver of what I've been to it. And, um, just after I started, my partner and I moved to Vietnam for no particular good reason, except that we wanted to. And um, it turned out to be the most incredible opportunity in my career life. Um, at the time we moved to Vietnam, there was a change in the law of association, which meant that um, while local NGOs were not strictly legal, they were much more tolerated. And so suddenly there were this wealth of new Vietnamese NGOs that just needed some help and astonishing came my very limited skills, which extended to being able to read and comprehend uh, proposal templates suddenly became very useful. So being able to speak English, um, wanting to help these organisations um, define and, and build frameworks around their vision and to help them understand how they can get funding in the same way we talk. Um, I did a lot of volunteer work, um, not because I was, again, strategically positioning myself, but just because there was a lot of work that needed to be done and no one had any money. And I felt that you know, my husband was in finally support by the Australian taxpayers, and I could do something back as well. Um, all that experience was was really fundamental for me to understand how different parts of the development sector work. I've worked in, right across the day cycle from trying to help people to people and organisations to access funding to helping them design programs that will deliver positive health impacts, um, working with people to work out how we can get back to the data we need to um, really demonstrate both the impact that is being made and the gaps where maybe more work is needed. And I really cannot emphasize enough how important real great monitoring and evaluation is. Under, it underpins all our work in all sectors. Um, so I did a lot of work um, with local NGOs, some work with um, international NGOs, and quite a lot of work with WHO, which um, made me fairly certain that I didn't want to work with a multilateral organisation <laughs> full time. Great work, but the bureaucracy is maddening. So 
for me, um, I to I guess how I ended up working with Apt um, was a little bit of luck and um, probably a tiny bit of strategy for the first time in my life. Um, I had applied for a couple of positions, um, overseas positions with Apt, um, got shortlisted, didn't get them. But um, when I came back to Canberra to uh, the short course and monitoring and evaluation, I reached out to the then director of JSHS Specialist Health Service, which is where I now work, and I had a coffee with him to find out more about the program. And um, at the end, and just to try to have my face in his head next time he was looking for someone, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, go for a position. And, um, and he did mention that there was a full time position coming up, but I probably wouldn't be interested in it because it was based in Canberra. Um, luckily, we were planning to move back to Canberra, <laughs> so I <laughs> threw my hat in the ring, and, um, and that's how I ended up working with that. And I feel it was very lucky for me to start working with an organization that really does reflect the values that I also hold their commitment to making positive impact in people's lives, their commitment to equity and equality, both within the organization itself and in the programs that they run, I think are just such such a linchpin of good development, being mission driven and ensuring that the benefits of the work we do are equitably shared. So I've got, I think, maybe two or three pieces of advice that I found really so, so helpful when I first started. The first one is about money. So it's changed a little bit since I started, but um, when I first started consulting, people would always ask me what you got paid in the last year. Now, when you're starting out, you don't really want to charge people very much because you actually will not have the value to <laughs> You can be, but you know, <laughs> you don't want to you know, have people kind of paying you a lot of money and then you're just, you know, delivery is not that great. So the best piece of advice I got was put your daily rate at where you want it to be and then discount it so that you are still offering people excellent value for money, recognizing that you are also benefiting because you're getting the experience and the opportunity and the networks, but don't sell yourself short. So do put your, put your rate where you want it to go. And that's a, you know, just a really practical tip. The other thing is show up, you know, if there is work to be done and people don't have funding for it and you've got time and skills, then step up and give them those skills. We work in development for a reason because we really want to help change happen. And you don't always get a fat salary for doing that. Actually, you kind of do, but, <laughs> yeah. but um, it's, you know, the experience you get, not just professionally, but personally, by turning up and volunteering is so valuable. Um, other things, maybe deadlines. You'd be surprised <laughs> at how rare that is and what a great USP it can be if, if you just put on, do your work, <laughs> do your work, do it to a high quality and get it in on time. Um, other than that, apply for a lot of jobs. For jobs you might have the skills for, because a lot of our male counterparts will look at a list and see it as something that is a list of key selection criteria and just decide that if you've know, got one or two of them, that's plenty. And we need to be better about doing that as well. Right? How do I? Think about the experience that I've got and turn it into these skills because it's often just about reframing what you already know and what you already have. Um, and also just 
the more jobs you apply for, the better at writing your CV, the better at writing your cover letters, and the better at interviewing you get. And that, you know, don't take uh, not that as a defeat. It's, you know, there's a lot of jobs and there's a lot of really smart people going for them who also have excellent skills. And so, you know, you just might not be the right fit for that one, but that doesn't mean you won't be the right fit for the next one. And uh, I think on that note, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm out of trouble for now. <laughs> That is absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. And what says somebody new to me is last one? I was like, grab it now while we're in between. And we have to get everyone on the line to hear us. It's quite difficult to hear, so I might bring it closer now. <laughs> Right. So let's first we can hear a little bit better, and um, perhaps someone could send a note. Just let um, Emily see. As I said, we are experimenting, and um, hopefully you will be able to hear us. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce the vet next. Um, Bernadette Whiteman, the director and founder. Oh, I just asked the question. Sorry. Does someone have a question for Sarah? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we'll keep it for later, Sarah. Thank you very much. Bernadette Whiteman, director and founder of Alina Whiteman. Alina Whiteman, but it's okay. I got it wrong last night. And so 
we we started. I was just the only one in one group originally, and so they would say to me like, "What do you mean group?" <laughs> and I'll say, "It's aspirational." <laughs> so, but now we have um, about thirty-five staff, mostly technical uh, staff working in um, gender um, this, uh, gender equality and disability and social inclusion issues. Monitoring and evaluation expertise. Um, so we've got quite a broad set of climate change expert, uh, um, agricultural economists, and sort of quite a array. And we mostly do um, we do a lot of work on projects, like bigger projects. Uh, we do a lot of design work, do a lot of independent reviews and evaluations. And we also do some. We have some small hubs that um, that offer specific quality and monitoring and learning uh, support to much bigger programs. So um, that's us. But what I wanted to talk about was working for managing contractors, which I did for six years with Cardno. So, and I did that not long, it was only a year, because I had that year at UNDP. I can't get that back. Anyway, um, with the first thing I learned when I joined a big managing contractor, was um, I was really gobsmacked at the attitude towards was uh, a slash feedback, like and what they thought of was a slash feedback, which I knew a lot of which was not true. Like they honestly thought that people weren't working hard. They also thought people didn't care about the project. And like my experience was, people did care deeply about the project, but they had very little time and they had very so many constraints. Um, I also learned that um, manage, it, it, it pays poorly. <laughs> so I had this idea and then this myth when you're working in um, other slash FIFA that you know the private sector they're lining their pockets like they're earning a all earning a fortune. <laughs> they were so not true. I was like, oh <laughs> this is a bit of a shame. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also learned, and there was also this sense, and I don't know if it's still true, but back in the day, when I was that if you're in the private sector, you somehow must be super smart, super on the right track, and you know, government's a bit sluggish and all that. And I learned that actually, people in the private sector aren't more intelligent. <laughs> like they, you know, it's just a mixed bag. Oh, yeah, like the bureaucracy. Is so um, the other thing I learned was um, that uh, people were often very nice to me when I was in Aussie because I was like that really. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, why are those people bringing me anymore and saying hi <laughs> and going out for coffee or why? And I thought, oh, I don't have two hundred and fifty million dollars. <laughs> So, so you sort of, but it actually goes a little bit further than that. You actually start getting, you get start getting treated differently. You start getting treated like your identity as a managing contractor. Suddenly, you're not. When I was in other, you know, you can be seen as oh, really a getter or quite intelligent or whatever. Suddenly, in a managing contractor, oh, you're a managing contractor, so blood sucker, basically, and. It's, it's really weird. It's really weird. It's like I wasn't me anymore. I was like, I'm still me. But yeah. So um, I also learned in a managing contractor that actually the technical work is quite limited. I was interested in development. And like when you join Aussie, you think you're joining because you're going to do development work. And then you learn quickly that, oh, no, I'm not really. <laughs> I'm going to do a lot of talking points, a lot of briefs, a lot of things that aren't really that related. But And the same is true of a managing contractor, although there are roles you can get into, which is good when you get to go on a project and things like that, which is, there's a lot of opportunities in that way. Um, I learned that I'm very competitive. Like, so I did some BD and I liked it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's quite the competitive thing, I okay. guess. So, um, but the thing about the BD stuff is, um, you can't be, can be explain what BD is. Oh, sorry, business development. You know, sorry. Bidding for work. Bidding for work. 
So you bid for the contract and you can tell you're bidding for the next big thing, you know, you get right into it. And you get really passionate about it. Um, and then you move and break your heart. Honestly, the first time I lost the bid, I called my idea, but I just, it was awful. Yeah, we all did. Yeah. So, but, but then when you win, like it's quite a <laughs> So, um, so I learned that about myself as well, that I'm actually quite like that. But it's sort of very grueling. And working as a managing contractor for uh, a long time, it gets a little bit uh, like, you know, like a team, you're part of a team, team sport, like, uh, like, you know, imagine the AFL teams, they have this sort of bonding and stuff and everybody else is terrible and that and that. So that can get, that can happen a bit. Um, the other thing that I learned was in a management, it is about money. There's no doubt about it. At the institutional level or the organisational level, the company level. But then there's all these people in there for whom it's about a whole lot more. So that's constant tension, I think, uh, between, you know, and it might not be a bad tension, um, but, yeah. And there is, and it's not just about the money, it's also about winning and getting bigger. And I find that in a little bit in the NGO sector as well, just the idea of winning and getting bigger becomes a bit of an objective. Some unspoken, but, you know, it's still there. Um, so the other thing I've learned even more recently is that, you know, and while I was there, that frank and fearless advice doesn't exist when you have to give it to feedback. And um, that's pretty hard, actually, like to accept that, you know, there's some things that happen in um, contracting, tendering, and procurement that's just not right. And there's very little you can do about it. And that's harsh. That's hard, yeah. So, um, and I guess I'll tell you some. So, some of the opportunities. So, <laughs> the beautiful thing is, you get to see how a project really works. So, honestly, I look back at my time at Jose and for some of the hard time I gave to some managing contractors, and I just feel guilty. <laughs> like, because I, I could be really harsh. And now I realise how much work goes into it. Like all the behind the scenes stuff, there's so much behind the scenes. So, um, and they just don't see it. Uh, so I think the, the little we know about each other makes it hard. Um, so it makes many things more visible. Um, and also that the good project staff are like gold, like pure gold. And they, they make a big difference in the world, actually. Um, on the gender issue side, so it can be a very masculine environment in a managing contractor, not always. Um, it can be there's a boys' club, uh, in some, in many, and they don't, I'm sure they don't see it for what it is, and even when you try and tell them, they don't see it. Not that oh, no, I have to lie, um, and the other thing I, as an observation, I noticed. All the senior women are really capable and smart, but the same is not true of senior men. Don't feel wasn't it? So, well, I started my own company, and one of the reasons was in January 2015 was that um, I wanted to be a bit different and I wanted it to be feminist, a feminist company in that it's look and feel and how we did went about our internal as well as our external work. And for me, that was about a particular way of working, a particular way that was collaborative, that was open, that was, um, uh, you, you do, when you come to a meeting and sit at the table, you don't have to put on your professional face and pretend you don't have to guard things so guard it's more open and it's more valuable and all that frank frankness and you can be more who you are always around the table around a whole bunch of men you have to put on the face yeah and it's like and then you monitor how you're paid and what you're saying from 
from an inside yourself. So uh, it's more collaborative, and I like I like to show that that can be just as profitable and just as successful as the um, uh, normal or the dominant way of working. So a managing contract that doesn't have to be like that. It can be successful and work in a different way. And I would argue more successful in our field because good development, good diplomacy is built on collaboration. It's built on respecting others. It's built on valuing others um, and valuing all voices. And that just makes sense in our world. So, uh, yeah, so that's a, why I started my company and I think we're building that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't actually heard much about your foundation, but it sounds awesome from what you've said. Um, in terms of like your inclusion practices and stuff internally, is there anything you're doing to, I guess, externally celebrate and promote those sort of practices for effective work? Yeah, so we write about it, about that stuff quite a lot. We promote, um, so there's a few ways, like so we have an Indigenous internship program, we have a young professionals program, and one of our younger professionals spoke at last night. Um, they try to create pathways for careers. Um, we also are looking at how we, you know, to grow and have offices overseas, we're doing it in collaboration with domestic companies that we grow together with. So we have a, an MOU that's collaboration rather than compete with, which is, I'm very excited about. So we have uh, a couple of those in place and they're just starting to grow, which is nice. Because I, the, the thing about the international, which, you know, is like, um, I think in many countries we've sucked out all of the, um, all of the really great talent into projects. And what's left is that there's very little market in the domestic space in many countries for having our own consulting companies, having our own managing contractor companies, because they're all employers in individual contracts. So I think another approach, and I think it is a more feminist approach, is to actually work in collaboration with the very few small companies that there are and work together to build your companies together in that space. Because what we bring, say we being Whiteland Group, is a, a international expertise across a range of sectors and an operational backbone, for example, and a whole lot of ability to speak donor language. Uh, but what we lack is um, amazing expertise in country with networks and ways of working that are uh, totally <laughs> effective and, and work in these in you know I'm talking about specific specifically here that you know um, and ways of working that might be different to a uh, Western way of working. So together to me that just makes sense because together we bring the best of everything. And we can help each other grow together instead of that we don't have to compete, we don't have to suck up our talent into us and so forth. So that's an example. Yeah, no, awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Jackie, so Jackie Lacey, Managing Director of ABT Associates, a global mission driven company with over 3,000 staff working over 50 countries. If Improving the lives of disadvantaged people. Uh, Jackie's got a deep practical understanding of development. Um, she, prior to um, working at ABT, worked at Los Angeles DFAT in multiple high profile projects, including the head of Los Angeles Asia, head of the Food Security Branch, Global Crisis Response Coordinator, head of the Energy Branch in Canberra. Extensive experience in representing Australia on UN funds and programs and at conferences, a BA in economics with honours, and serves on the board of UNICEF Australia and is a member of Chief Executive Women. Over to you, Jackie. Thank you, Chris, and it's lovely to meet everyone. Um, so maybe I'll start at the beginning. I was born in Garoka in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, and I grew up. Um, we'll spend the first sort of 11 years of my life 
living in a very beautiful but remote and very um, complex place uh, called Mount Hargren, uh, which again is in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Really beautiful, but one of the worst places on earth to live if you're a woman. I mean, the, the violence rates against women in the highlands of Papua New Guinea are really shocking. And I didn't live an expatriate life. My father was a, an agriculture teacher and we just lived on that farm, on a farm, and we used to go into the markets in, you know, we used to go into town for school, just for local bus with all the local kids. Um, but I have really powerful memories of growing up in that community and the challenges that women in particular faced. And I have two sisters, so we're just girls in our family. So we spend all of our time with the women. Um, and you, you know, you can't help it, but you're absorbed into a culture where there is, you know, great disparities between the role of women and men in Papua New Guinea, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea in particular. Um, and from that time, I always, then my older sister would have had to have gone to boarding school because there wasn't any high schools. So we moved back to Australia um, and, I, and I completed all my schooling in Cairns. And then I went to, uh, all I wanted to do was international development. So I went to university in um, Brisbane. And then as soon as I finished university, I got a graduate job with, um, with ADAB at the time. So the precursor to AusAid. Uh, so this was a very long time ago. And I, so I have worked in international development ever since I left, um, ever since I left university and I've loved every year of it. So, you know, when you start, you're doing it for, for quite naive reasons, um, but it's been such a fascinating, intellectually challenging and personally enriching career. I would just encourage everyone to do it. Uh, you get to work with the most amazing people. Um, I, you know, I've just worked with extraordinary people and, uh, you know, from all sorts of backgrounds. And you can't help it. You just bump into them all the time in our field. So, I, you know, my big advice to everyone is if you're even vaguely interested in getting into international development, I really encourage it. Uh, I just think it's just endlessly interesting and meaningful work. Uh, so I spent 23 years in government working for mostly all day, but at the end for DFAT. And I did actually work inside DFAT for a few years as an economist um, for a while. Uh, and I didn't really have a strategic plan. I just, and this is another really good piece of advice, I just worked for really good people. So in the end, I just chose jobs where I thought, you're a really great person. I think I can learn from you. I'm not sure what that work is about. You often don't know anyway. And I just went to work for one really good person after another. And I learned so much from that experience. I had great mentoring and support through that, through that experience. I didn't specialise in anything. I dabbled in a lot of different things. I... Um, spent probably more time working on Indonesia and Papua New Guinea than any other particular country subset. But I also worked on multilateral work. I, I did a lot of policy work. I managed our aid budget. It was interesting because the budget came out last night. I used to manage the budget section in my day. Um, so, you know, I, so one of my reflections is working for good people is like gold. So if you know good people, chase them down and find ways to work with them. And working in good teams where it's, um, you know, collaborative, where, you know, you've got great relationships, sees you through some dark days. And development is hard work. We work on some really challenging issues. And our staff base, you know, most of our staff, if you're working in development, either I say my staff because I'm managing director, so I'm the boss, but otherwise they're your colleagues. They're mostly going to be colleagues living and working in developing countries and they face enormous challenges. I mean, I'm speaking a bit at a time when COVID is ravaging um, many of the countries in which we're working in, having a devastating impact on people's personal and professional lives. And what gets you through the hard times is the relationships you forge at work and the strength of those friendships and the culture that you bring. So. Um, working in good teams and for good people is really, really important. But after, so maybe if I duck back, so after 23 years, by the time I left, I was a division head in government, which is a reasonably senior role. 
And I was managing Australia's aid program to Indonesia. I'd been in Jakarta for four years. It was the most extraordinarily good job you could imagine. Um, and I still think probably the best job I've ever had, even though I really love my current job. Uh, you know, we had this great partnership with the Indonesian government. Our aid budget was growing. We had extraordinary people working with us, great partners in civil society. Uh, we were able to do some really innovative development work. It was extraordinary. But at the end of that period, I was a working mother. Um, I had two young sons. When you're in developing countries and working, one of the great advantages for working women is that you get phone help. And I'll be really honest, I could not have done the jobs I've done without having support at home. You can't be a mother. I mean, it, Having help at home meant that when I did have time with my children and my partner, Ian, who's amazing, I could focus on them instead of all of the domestic chores that I otherwise would have been doing. Uh, so it is really tough as you go up in your career to balance um, work and family and find effective ways to do that. Why I left government in the end was I was returning to Australia. My husband wanted to go back to full-time work. He had basically done very part-time or no work for years. And we just couldn't make it work as a family for me to stay in government at a senior level. Um, the government at that stage, it's changed a bit. It's much more flexible uh, in, in managing people's um, personal and professional lives. But when I left, which was nearly eight years ago now, um, it wasn't nearly as flexible. So that's another lesson I've really learned is you've got to understand what the needs of your workforce are. And if you can't accommodate the diverse needs of your staff, you will lose them because there was no way I could give up being a mother, right? And it was my partner's turn to have a bit of a to have a full-time job and I needed to work part-time. And I couldn't get that from my organization. So I left. I I was really lucky that I landed in APT. Um, it was a really good fit for my values because I only worked in government. I only cared about development. Um, I And I really wanted to work somewhere that I didn't feel personally compromised because that was my whole life, right? I remember I was talking to different organisations. Um, uh, one of the big four accounting firms approached me to set up a development practice for them. Uh, this was, of course, when the aid program was growing. Companies thought we could make they could make money out of it, and it just wasn't a good fit because I knew I'd never be motivated by the money side of the work. I really wanted to work for an organisation where the, the the commitment to mission was as strong as what I felt in government, and so, and I found that definitely at Act Associates, but I also work really collegiately with a lot of other managing contractors. We compete. Um, really strongly when we're going for bids. But when we would pass it beyond that particular point in a bidding cycle, we face really similar challenges and we work really collaboratively together. So I work really collaboratively with Jo at Cardinal, with, with Bernadette at her company and with Keith at um, Petrotech. Because we're all in the same business, we have many of the same challenges. And what I've discovered and what I didn't realise when I was in government is People working in managing contractors care as much about mm. development as people in government. There is no difference, really. So um, I, I have never felt that leaving government and working for a contractor in any way sort of compromised my commitment to development. And I've never witnessed that in any of the other managing contractors that I collaborate with um, regularly. So I don't think anyone should feel... Uh, a nervousness about going over to the contracting world. I, I do think working and managing contractors is different from at least working in government. In government, I always I like analogies, right? So I always felt like in government, it was like curating an art gallery. You could choose the paintings. You could select the artists that you wanted to demonstrate. So you had control over the look and the feel of the, of the art displays. But now I'm in a managing contract, I'm actually painting the picture, right? So you're not controlling the big picture and the big allocation of work, but you control the artwork. So you have a lot more direct implementation responsibility. So it's a different, it's a very different um, role, but it's empowering in a, in a, in a different way to work in the government. I sometimes miss the policy work. I miss um, 
the, the big decisions around where development resources get allocated because that really matters. But um, I, th I think being able to deliver really high quality work at the individual project and program level can have a profound impact on the communities we, we seek to support. So it's, it is really still very meaningful work. It's just different from what I experienced in government. Um, when I joined that, I started, I worked in their international development practice. Um, and then three years ago, I became managing director of the Australia business. We've got, so we, we said there were three thousand staff globally, but in Australia, we've got about, well, in the Australian business, we've got 800, but 700 of them are uh, located in developing countries. So, um, uh, yeah, we've got a pretty lean Australian business, but a very large um, workforce living and working in developing countries. Uh, one of development is a people business largely, and uh, the biggest, you know, the biggest gift that I can give my company is how I can attract and retain talent. Right, so. If we can build the right culture, if we can create the right incentives um, to attract and retain and build capability within our workforce, then we know we'll be successful. And, and, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing now. I've almost, um, I, I don't do a lot of direct development work, but I, I always say I, I remove obstacles for really good people to work for that and do good development work. But I do miss getting more directly involved in projects and programs. But I think as your career progresses, there are different ways you can contribute to the development story. And if I can attract really great people to work for us, then maybe that's that's probably a better gift than me trying to do that work myself, but that's how I console myself. Um, certainly much better that Sarah does the uh, health <laughs> policy advice than I do. Um, but yeah, so I would I would definitely encourage people uh, to keep persevering in develop. I know it can be a hard field to get into. I I would recommend people spend a big chunk of their career living and working in developing countries. I don't think you can work on international development from Australia. Like you can do it for bits of your career, but it's pretty hard to do it for a long time. Uh, you've really got to spend time living and working in the countries and in the communities where we're seeking to help. Uh, I do think, as um, Bernadette mentioned, diversity is incredibly important. Uh, ACT is already a very um, equal place when it comes to women. Um, and, you know, we have, we do gender pay gap analysis, we have equal pay, we have, um, equal numbers of staff, we have equal numbers of women in senior roles, we have equal numbers of female team leaders. Um, in some places we have too many women and I and that's a risk for us. So it's you know in your, in your section um, there's too many I'm women. No. Excellent. Yeah no, no that's not good. But I think diversity matters and you've got to you've got to create diversity of both genders. And I, I actually think the risk is not that there's a boys club, but there's actually a risk that there are not enough in, in development. So um, uh, uh, I'm not so worried about the gender dynamics, at least where from where I could see it was true in DFAT, like and of okay, very female heavy. Uh, and I think there are a lot of women in international development. Where diversity really kicks in for us is more ethnic diversity um, and trying to get many more of our team leaders, senior leaders in countries to be staff of those countries and really promoting uh, local leadership and local um, local capability. Uh, and I think COVID has made that an even more important and accelerated ambition for all of us uh, to do. Uh, it is our, you know, when we had to pull out a lot of international staff after COVID first hit and with all the borders were closing and, we couldn't get many backs. You know, we're all incredibly dependent on the local staff that we had working in developing countries. And they were, of course, they did a fantastic job, you know, no surprise. Um, to some extent, we've got to get our clients to appreciate that because it's not, they're not always decisions that sit in our hands. But I think pushing for diversity, um, racial diversity, uh, and, and other, you know, really thinking about other minority groups 
Um, we're launching our first Pride at Apps group on Monday. I was doing photos for it today. It was quite fun. Um, which is an employee network group for LGBTIQ plus um, staff. Of course, in Australia, that's a really easy ask, right? Many of our staff who are in who identify in that group are really open and, and you know proud and happy to participate. Staff in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea who are gay or lesbian or the transsexual, really, really challenging um, norms to confront. And we need to create workplaces that are safe and um, where people can bring their whole selves to work. And if we can get, uh, you know, we also, you know, in Timor Leste where we work, um, a lot of homeless youth are. are uh, in the LGBTIQ plus community. So they get evicted from their homes, they get um, that they experience a huge amount of violence. Uh, and you know, so it's really important for our work that we're able to engage with minority communities and therefore we need staff from minority groups who are who have lived experience are able to engage with them. So I do think that diversity piece is more and more important in our business. Um, uh, particularly in our overseas groups. I might just stop there and hand over to Joe. I, I should be clear, I've worked with each of these women and <laughs> going the event of being 53 years. I have had a long career. So Joe was actually a graduate for me in um, in 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 Oz A. I went to Nirenberg and I have worked together on Indonesia and other programs over the years. So this is an example of the marvelous people and women that you get to meet in your business and the community that you get to, to establish. Great. Uh, question for Bernadette or Jackie. Or Jackie. Or Jackie. I'll just ask them what they're doing. Uh, so we're just going to stick this time to Jackie. Okay. So and we'll do the general stuff at the end. I'm just being very focused at the moment. Yeah, I'm just wondering what's the pathway to get into touch with the for example, if you have ocean policy for 25 years, so what would be the pathway to get into it? So I, I always think you've got to live in a developing country where donors put money. Uh, so for Australia, it's mostly Melanesia. I mean, I would go and work in Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands myself, and I would work as a volunteer for an NGO and then um, and, and, and in an area where government is funding. So unfortunately, we can only do work where we're paid to do work. So you've got to choose sectors and locations where there is um, funding for international development. And if you, know, if you can, as Sarah was saying, just go and live in those communities, make yourself useful and slowly build up your skill set, uh, it is a good pathway to getting in. I, I do also recommend people do a master's of evaluation. I, I honestly think evaluation is the most important and scarcest skill set in international development, and you can marry it with pretty much any other skill set you have. So if you're able to evaluate whatever your area of expertise is, that is a rare skill set that many managing contractors and, and government clients are looking for. Thank you. So, Joe, um, Joe Cho, Cardinal's Regional Manager for the Pacific and Global Senior Principal for Gender and Inclusion, um, supporting initiatives such as the Pacific Women's Support Unit, Women's Leadership Initiative, Balance of Power, and um, Vanuatu Health Program. She's been at Cardinal for three years, following a career of 15 years with OSA. Theme here. Oh, no, it's Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working on the AIDS program in PG, including five years living in Port Moresby, as an example. Uh, managed the law and justice section program and the subnational governance program. Um, she's been a counselor for PG and Tuvalu, and she managed the manager and responsible recovery package following the and Joe is also director of DFAT's Gender Equality Branch, responsible for supporting DFAT's implementation of its gender equality and women's empowerment strategy. So it's a very strong 
background from Gen Z. Hello, thanks, Chris. Um, I think lots of uh, lot, a lot of what's been said, I I really um, resonates with me, and I agree with. So I won't repeat all of that because uh, we have lots of intersections in common. Um, but I I studied uh, arts law at uni, and uh, I joined Aussaid in two thousand and three as a graduate. Um, and I came into Aussaid thinking um, Pacific. No, I'm not interested. What's that? I want to work in Asia. Um, but I landed in the PNG branch where Jackie was my boss. She was my boss's boss, boss, I think. Uh, I was a graduate, but she was the branch head. And I was working on law and justice, and I was really keen to work in law and justice because law has been my background. Um, when I was at law school, I really wanted to be a prosecutor, and I, you know, I wanted to put the bad guys away. But I went to a really kind of left-wing uni and came out thinking, oh, the legal system is stacked against the average person and it's, you know, uh, systemically just unfair and uh, I didn't want any part of it. Um, but it's interesting because I ended up going to Papua New Guinea and I ended up um, being posted there for five years and most of that time I worked on the Law and Justice Program. And when you go to a country like Papua New Guinea where rule of law is extremely challenging, um, you really appreciate the law and you really do um, want to see um, a legal system be able to function and be able to protect and support, particularly uh, women who are victims of violence. And as Jackie said, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere around you um, and it's incredibly um, confronting. So I think that was absolutely a very formative time for me and, and something that has really fueled my passion for what I wanted to do. Um, I think one of my first supervisors in Aussie, who was a bit of a character, Robin Taylor, he said to me, I remember him saying to me, work out what you want to do and keep doing it until someone tells you to stop. <laughs> and I thought that was such a great piece of advice and I still Still follow it to this day and I think by that like wherever you're working wherever you go you have a certain amount of autonomy and actually you have quite a bit of autonomy in how you're going to go about things and I think it's really important to have your own development philosophy and what you believe in in terms of what effective development is and what it means I think everyone has their own um, and I certainly have my own and I think that's that's really what's driven me in terms of what I've been interested in or what I've pursued and what I've wanted to work on. Um, I think that time in Papua New Guinea, I was working with the law and justice sector and it was I was working on a program that was all about supporting that sector's ownership um, and determining what they wanted to do, what the sector wanted to do. And at the time, you know, incredibly, that was a bit controversial and it was actually very difficult to manage the politics of, you know, government of Australia and government of PNG and who, who called the shots. So um, I think that being driven by that vision and that passion of what you believe is the right thing to do to support good development outcomes is, is really what can, can drive you to how you work, how you make decisions, what people you surround yourself with, um, and the way you go about things, you know, really having some principles that ground you. So I think that that concept of ownership, that concept of supporting local empowerment to drive development, you know, in the way that, that local people want to, that really is what has driven um, my uh, approach. Um, I think, as Jackie has said, you get incredible opportunities working in Aussaid, um, which then became DFAT, uh, particularly when you're working overseas. Um, so after five years in um, PG, I came back to Canberra for a bit and then I worked in, I did a posting in Fiji for almost four years where I looked after the Fiji and Tuvalu bilateral programs. Um, and I think that was probably the best job I've ever had. So. I think being able to manage um, big programs, you have a lot of autonomy, you can manage millions of dollars, you essentially get to determine how those dollars are spent. And that means you get to um, engage day to day with people from government, from civil society, from private sector, 
you're seeing amazing opportunities and you're able to kind of bring, you know, support, technical support, money, grants, different kinds of assistance to try and seed and help uh, people that you think are going to do great things in that country. So I think the opportunity to do that is just special. Um, you, you know, it's pretty rare. So that was uh, an amazing experience. Um, when I came back from Fiji, I uh, came back to DFAT. So when I was in Fiji, I had become DFAT. None of us have talked about integration, but um, that was quite, um, yeah, that was quite an experience. Uh, so when I came back to DFAT, I think um, what I realised was that what I really love doing is working on programs. Um, and programs are just a way of, you know, exercising what you believe in in terms of your development philosophy to make this. It's a way of trying to get resources to those people and those groups that have so much potential to create change in their societies. So, um, yeah, I wanted to be able to keep doing that. Um, and I realised that uh, the opportunity to do that in Canberra is fairly limited. Um, you know, DFAT's devolved, it manages most of its programs overseas, so there's not really that many areas where you can be directly managing programs from DFAT. Um, and then I got this offer to work at, come and work at Cardno, uh, come to the dark side. Everyone said, oh, you've gone to the dark side. Um, so it was a really hard decision because I, I was just sort of taking a, a leap in the dark. I had no idea what it would be like. And, you know, I'd been at DFAT for 15 years and it was safe to just stay there and have a secure job. So I was very scared, um, didn't know what to expect. And, uh, but, but I think a formative thing was probably that when I came back from Fiji, my um, husband who had followed me to Fiji and followed me to Fiji and by then we had two young kids. He said, oh, he didn't want to do more overseas um, trips or, mission, you know, postings. So I thought, oh, I'm going to be in Canberra for the next 12, and my son had just started kindy, so for the next 12 years I'm going to be in Canberra, what am I going to do? Uh, so that's when I think when the Cardano offer came along, I thought, well, actually, it's, this is an opportunity to keep working on programs from Canberra because this is what Cardno does and implements the programs. Um, so I came to Cardno, um, many of the same observations as Bernadette. I mean, it's a real identity shift after, after working in DFAT and being on the other side. Um, and I think one of the, I mean, it is absolutely, as Jackie said, very, very focused on implementation as opposed to policy, very operational. So things that I have never even thought about that are involved in making a program happen, I've, you know, now been involved in much more than I probably want to, you know. Um, so I think it's really, I think it's been really interesting to take, you know, DFAT will set the policy, it will design the programs, it will put them out to tender. Um, you know, if you win a program and then if you say, right, we've got this design and we've got this contract, now what do we do? How do we implement this thing? That's the interesting bit. Um, that's It's challenging, but it's, it's been really interesting to be involved in that from how you turn these ideas and concepts into reality. Um, a big part of it is finding the right people, but uh, a huge part of it is, is a lot of the operational support you have to put around those people and everything from, you know, how you open a bank account in Kiribati to, you know, how you, how you contract people in different countries. Um, all, these, all these really, these details that would never occur to you when you're, when you're in GFAT or um, they, these are the things you end up working on. So I think... Um, it's good and bad. I mean, I think there are, it suits some people and not others. So I think some people might come into a, a contractor and be expecting to work on monitoring, you know, monitoring frameworks or gender policies and end up working on local tax regimes or something like that. Um, so I think it's important that for people that are working on that level of detail, they, they have an eye for it, they don't mind it, and they are able to see it as part of the big picture because without all of that stuff, none of these programs would work and 
we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So we, we have uh, a great team of people who uh, are really fantastic at that stuff um, and have the detailed mind and the patience and are able to go through just really extensive, rigorous processes um, that, that it takes to get a grant out or hire people um, or you know, set up an office overseas. So I think that's that's the bread and butter um, of working in a contractor is, is all of those operational things behind the scenes. Um, and often because the you know DFAT really doesn't have any visibility of that, um, it, may, it may not be appreciated. Uh, and there might be a little bit of a gulf between you know where you're coming from and where DFAT's coming from. I guess the other observation is um, it is very client facing and when you're in DFAT, you never consider yourself as the client, but when you go to the contractor, DFAT's the client. Um, so a lot of your engagement is with the client and is with um, discussing and managing their expectations, their concerns and their issues and trying to, I guess, work out solutions between, you know, what it takes to to implement well and what it takes to meet the expectations and needs and uh, views of the client. So playing that middle role is really important. Um, and I think as Bernadette said, it, it's a business. So I had no idea what a margin was. <laughs> uh, I certainly know what it is now. Um, I think that yeah, to some extent, you know, understanding the business, the business model, and at the end of the day, business development is everything if you don't win work you don't exist so everyone you know plays some role in business development but i think the key thing is the best way to win work is to be good at what you do so strong implementation actually implementing programs as well and delivering results is the best way to win your next project so that's our philosophy and that's how i think people can see the connection between you know all the work it takes to um, register your power in Honiara and you know winning the next project. It, it's all it's very much interlinked. Um, so I think it's been um, yeah really fascinating. There's lots of opportunities, and I I think the main thing that keeps me going is um, working on programs that I think are really meaningful. I think that um, they're really rare. To be honest, I think there's lots, lots of stuff out there that's just doing stuff. Um, but once in a while, you come across one or two programs that are absolute gold. You know they're going to make a difference. You know they're going to change things in people's lives. And they're the, they're the things that just keep you going. You want to be able to protect them. You want to be able to support them in any way you can and navigate through the system and any rules and find ways to make it work. Um, and I think that if you have a mind for that and a passion for that, then, you know, you're absolutely going to make a, a huge difference um, in, in development work. So all of those opportunities are really, you know, there when you're working for a contractor um, because I think, you know, through all the, all the sort of grunt work, um, to be able to make that connection to that person, you know, in Fiji or Papua New Guinea or Solomon Islands, and to be able to see the difference that it's making in their country, in their country context, through through their perspective, um, I think that's that's the connection that really, you know, enables you to live this incredible life of uh, having a career that has value you and meaning to you while you're sitting in Canberra in a beautiful bar in Sydney. So, yeah, I think that's, um, that's what keeps us all going. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, one question for Joe. Well, we're going to open it up for questions now, so we'll be able to answer it. Emily, I'm just going to get Emily to do the first call, see if we've got some online questions. No, no online questions. We encourage our online people if they'd like to ask the questions. So, um, questions for any of us, because all of us have yeah. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, different experiences. 
Um, I've got a question based on something you said, Jackie, about how um, your career has been quite. Um, you haven't had a specific focus for following great leaders and many of good advice. But I've had kind of conflicting advice about you need to specialize to kind of get a role, and that's really important. So, as someone who's now recruiting, what if it's not a speciality? What are the kind of skills you're looking for for people to have going into their managing projects and new roles? So I think it, I think a lot depends on what sort of work you want to do within a managing contractor. And I think a lot of what Joe said was really important. There's a lot of the Australia-based roles are much more focused on operational support. So it's teams that deal with contracting, procurement, financial acquittals, um, HR recruitment, um, risk management, audit systems. So if you've got those really good skills, you can get a job in a managing contractor, but it's in the back office work. It's not the frontline development work. Most of the frontline development work is not done in Australia. It's actually done in our field offices. So, which again is why if you really want to um, do that more frontline development work, it's, it, it's the work we do in country. And I think you need to combine uh, a level of technical skills, at least at the beginning, with country knowledge, because now it's really hard for complete outside outsiders to influence change, right? If you don't know that, I mean, sometimes if you've got a lot of experience in a lot of different environments, it's quite you know, you can bring that to a to a country. But I think understanding the context, the cultural context in which you're working, is really valuable. So I think at the beginning of your career, having a specialization, which I would seriously recommend is married with an evaluation um, skill set combined with country knowledge and language is is a real is really important to start off your career. But of course, you know, I, I'm now at a point in my career, you know, in my 50s, as in any area where you start off more I started off as an economist. I mean I came in as a graduate economist, not as just as a graduate. And for my first few years I worked mostly doing economic analysis but of course as you go up the ladder my, I never use my economics anymore um, at all and and my, it's my management skills my leadership skills my ability to, um, to 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 craft a narrative that binds people together to be able to bring um, and attract and recruit good people that is my best skill set now uh, so, but I think to start off with, you need a specialisation that's technical if you want to be overseas combined with a country um, experience. But then you can choose. You can choose to remain a specialist. Uh, so, you know, if you were to choose gender equality, and maybe this is a question for you, Joe, because you've you've both become a manager, but you've also got your gender equality hat on, whereas I'm now just pretty much all a manager. How do you balance the choices between going thematically specialising versus being more generalist? Yeah, um, I think uh, there, I guess the, the generalist skill set is program management. Like at, at whatever level, at lots of different levels, um, you, don't, you don't need to be a specialist in all those different areas Jack talked about, but you could be a generalist that's able to do good recruitment, manage a budget, can manage a contract. Um, and, you know, a lot of our jobs are program management jobs at, at different levels. So I think that um, uh, you, can, you can take, you know, your career pretty far just with those, a good strong set of program management skills that then you gain country experience and you, you also get exposed to technical areas through that project management because you're managing a gender program or you're managing a human rights program or whatever it is. Um, so uh, that's probably the bulk of the head office type of jobs and to some extent if you're uh, going overseas sort of operational management type jobs in, in programs but yeah otherwise as Jackie said um, most of the kind of advisory jobs um, or short term or long term consultant jobs that are based in Australia are technical based and usually in, in a sector. Um, or you know, cross cutting like design and um, I think in my case, um, yeah, I guess I've I've sort of combined 
general program management because I look after our programs in the Pacific um, with a focus on gender that's cross-cutting across the company. Um, and partly it works because a big part of my program portfolio are gender programs. So a lot of it is about taking what we learn from those programs and sharing that across other programs that we operate in and vice versa. So that learning and sharing and, and drawing out the technical learnings from those programs. So, yeah, I think that there's definitely um, some level of technical engagement, even if you're working in the general program management field. Mary, you're specialists all together. Yes. I mean, you are a technical health person that's had a career in that. So yes, so it, is I, it is. And um, I think, you know, working on the program that I work on now is really, it's the first full-time job I've had in the last years. <laughs> <laughs> but I've rarely been out of work. Um, and for me, it has been such a huge learning curve in terms of what goes on behind. As you say, you know, I had no idea about ops. I had no idea about contract management. Um, I, you know, it, it was very weird for me to be on the side of managing uh, consultants yeah. and to be fully assuring their work. And I think this is where I learned that getting things in on time is really yeah. not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> But it is really important, you know, to to just um, be reliable. But yeah, it's been um, really fascinating for me to learn what goes on in the in the kind of back room, mm -hmm. um, having been almost always just really program focused. And I do miss working in communities. For me, that has always been my driving force: is to actually to understand that yes, what we do is complicated and it doesn't always work but when it does it's amazing and to really see that it's not always throwing more money at a problem but it is really tapping into the knowledge and experience of the communities in which you're working and letting them guide what needs to be done great question yeah. um thank you that was amazing and all got such amazing inspirational stories. So thank you for that um, presentation. Um, my question is around life post ARF. So um, what impact does that have on women being employed as advisors? So that advisory remuneration framework wasn't <laughs> had a lot of issues, but um, at least it was some kind of structure, whereas in this completely competitive environment um, where women may not be able to be competitive because they have children or need maternity leave and those kind of things. How will that happen? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, it's a, it is a brilliant question because the ARF, so for, does every, not everyone in the room will understand what it is. So DFAT used to have this system where it, it set the rates of particular levels of years of experience for particular skill sets. And anyone who fitted that, whether you're a man or a woman, you, you, you got the same rate. So it was very prescribed. And it meant there was basically everyone got paid the same for equivalent work. It was guaranteed. In the US where, um, you know, you got paid the amount of your last job, all of the inequities in career paths were compounded by that, by that system. And they walked away from that actually for equity reasons. So I think for a lot of the firms that are bidding for the bigger projects, we have um, we have to have our own remuneration frameworks, market testing. So it's not like it's open slather and individual negotiation. And in our company, we every job is rated against the skill set, and we have a guarantee in our company of equivalent pay for equivalent work. And we do uh, gender pay gap analysis every two years, which is really big for that. So the big companies, all big companies, we have something similar to that. I'm sure Cardinal does. Um, it'd be good to hear what smaller companies um, like Bernadette's do. But if you're an individual negotiator, if you're a consultant, so you're not sitting inside one of those big jobs, you have to negotiate hard for your pay, particularly women, which is the mm. point that you make. Women under undersell their rates all the time. And if everybody knows this, so 
just up your rate. Find out what other people are getting paid. Transparency of rates really drives equity in pay. So if you don't know, find someone who does work with what work, preferably find a male, find out what they're paid and just ask for the same and really push for it. Like don't don't ever feel afraid of asking. Sometimes people can say yes, sometimes they can't. But my goodness, people should ask for the rates that are fair. So you've got to take a lot of courage in doing that, particularly for women. Um, let's talk about this since my name. I'm a bit of a newbie in this space, um, but very pleased to meet um, Joe because I've just started with a colleague working on quite a discreet consultancy supporting Pacific women as they transition to the new gender equality program. So we're working from here remotely into Suva and PNG primarily. But I, I guess I wanted to just throw into the mix so it's more of a comment than a question because a, a number of us here have got questions around, you know, career path, choices, trade-offs and all of that. And um, I guess I've come into the space, I've been working in consultancy, executive and career coaching, facilitation, that kind of thing in the last few years. And, what my colleague and I are bringing to this program is um, in the area of change management, in the area of coaching for change, in the area of partnerships experience. So neither of us have development credentials as such. Um, I, I'm not a, a gender specialist, but we don't need to be for this particular program. So really anyone who's perhaps a bit more my vintage, and I've got a few years on the chat, um, just want to get you to maybe think about how you can add value in different ways. I mean, but, you know, it is a discrete program that we're, we're working on, and I guess I do have the benefit um, to bring to this program of, I did work, have a career in GFAT some, some years ago. I had a posting in Papua New Guinea, and I actually grew up in Fiji as well. So, Having lived and worked in Super and Port Moresby is undoubtedly a help um, of some sort. But I think that pro projects can benefit from a, a broader skill set so long as they're you know they're done in the right way. And just my comment on the ARF, I, I was actually I hadn't worked under it. I was delighted to see it go in some ways because it was so prescribed or is so prescribed. And yet you can find yourself within work now, but he's still prescribed up the ARE, you know, and, and from my perspective, having worked outside the government for 17 years, it, you know, the rigidity in it, you know, if you're equivalent to this level, that level, the fields I work in don't equate at all yeah. to that. So I guess what am I saying? Just think about things a little bit more laterally um, and you know, it's it's early days for me, so we'll just <laughs> see how it all goes. But I've really enjoyed tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question or comment? So, and, and any of you, because I'm trying to figure this one out, work myself. So, we're not post ARF, we'll be post ARF for another five years. So we're many managing contractors because we still got contracts with extensions. So, how's that going to work? No. How's that going to work if the dual system where you've got a bunch of people working under the area, and a bunch of people who are working under whatever employee evaluation proposition we're putting forward? And to, to one of you made a really good point, you know, DFAT don't change, contracts don't change. So I'm just wondering. It's very problematic. Yes. So um, the base joint of the
So you end up with um, women not being able to really go on long postings overseas with a project and so forth, especially if they children. Um, uh, and so forth, and affects men as well, uh, but predominantly women. So we put up this argument, but then sort of the ARF, when it was struck out, it was, but it stayed for projects and, and any extensions to those projects, which meant if you were two years into a 10 year project, it would be eight years uh, in, in the uh, keeping on going. And recently we put forward another paper. Uh, and I think largely informed by some of the active um, on why you should add parental leave at least. I mean, there's a, a raft of things, but that would be formal. Um, and we're still negotiating that or trying to get that through. But um, it's pretty hard, actually. Uh, I think, um, and I think that, I don't, I don't know that it's, there, the opaqueness of the DEPA has in relation to the managing contract world. They really, there's so much they don't see um, and so many realities, therefore, that they don't see that, and this is one thing. And so we need to keep demonstrating and showing that, uh, and what the, the realities are, but it's still hard to get the decision. Right now. Like, okay. But sometimes it's not good, but it's the minister. And um, even if you've got sympathetic people in feedback, they're constrained by our political system, which is not perfect, but it's not terrible either. Um, so I think all we can do is keep advocating for the right outcome consistently and more collectively. And I think that's where the IDCC, which both these women are on the board of, has been really successful at is bringing the community together and advocating on behalf of everyone, not just individual contractors. And I think that's much more powerful. So I was actually saw Jo um, in the meeting where she lobbied the former development minister on um, the equity aspects of the ARF and did a fantastic job and I think really changed his mind in that single meeting. So, but the point is to take the opportunity of the non-ARF world to negotiate really good um, outcomes for all staff, not leave particular groups vulnerable in, a, mm. in, a, in an environment which is more less transparent about rape. I think there is some real risks for, in particular, women um, in negotiating rates in a post ARF world. So we just have to be really careful. One more question. I was just going to add to that. I think there's a little bit of a different perspective, perhaps, as well, that if you're part of the managing contract, the system, that some of those issues around it being okay and those sorts of things will somehow be magically dealt with by that part of the sector. That's not necessarily that that's all. I mean, I disagree with that, but I think that's also part of the busting that needs to go on around competition and rates. Is, what is it that that management fee, that, you know, that mystical management fee for the, the yeah. that system actually does cover versus what would that rate cover when it comes to um, So I think you're absolutely right. That sole, you know, you're a sole trader out there and you're a woman and you're a man and you're single and everything, everything else being equal, you're going to need to adjust your rate to the you know, to the of the world, but it's not going to need to be a man or you're going to need to be a person with disability or if you're a person you know, facing circumstances. So I think there's a set of assumptions I think perhaps the public system that need to be grappled with as well around what does it mean to be attached to a management contractor versus what does it mean to be a sole trader and the types of things you want to ask for a management fee to sole trader versus you know don't worry you work with hard mode that's what it's all about think that's a big way about it's hard mode's job for money enough they'll be the refuge. So I think I think that's you know this is solidly a bus still needs to happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we can keep asking questions after if that seems to be for a little longer. Uh, but I want to say a sincere thank you to our speakers. We've got a small gift for you. Which we will take a look at
Yes.